Bienvenidos al foro de candidatos para la alcaldía. Si desea ver el foro con sus títulos en español, siga los siguientes pasos. Primero va a seleccionar configuración aquí abajo. Luego seleccione subtítulos y después va a seleccionar inglés autogenerados otra vez aquí abajo. Seleccione otra vez subtítulos y después va a seleccionar autotroducir. Y por último, seleccione el idioma al cual desea ver los subtítulos. Eso es todo y gracias por su atención. Welcome to the Mayoral Candidate Forum. If you want to view the forum with subtitles, please follow these steps. First, you will select settings, then select subtitles, then you will select English auto-generated, then select subtitles again. Then you will select auto translate and finally you may select the language to which you want to view the subtitles. That's it. Thank you guys for watching. So good evening everyone. My name is Delon Hiller. I will be your moderator for tonight's neighborhood forum, focusing on neighborhood issues. Tonight's forum is co-sponsored by One Omaha, Spark CDI, and Heartland Local Center. So getting into some of those organizations, One Omaha seeks to create a mobilized community in service. Of, so, of social change by lowering the barrier of entry for folks who seek to create change, develop, or, develop organizers, and creating strong partnerships in the civic sphere. Smart CDI invests in neighborhood transformation. Their vision for Omaha is a city where neighborhoods have the foundational assets necessary to thrive and prosper. Heartland Work Center is, is dedicated to helping build a community that works for all. A development organized leaders promote workers' rights and fosters a, a culture of civic engagement in order to build power and create change with immigrant and underrepresented communities. So the goal for our forum tonight is for the public to learn about each of the candidates here tonight um, and how they will handle issues around the community involving development, engagement, and neighborhoods. We will also be reaching out to you, our viewers tonight, uh, for questions from you later on in the forum. If you have any question that you would like to ask the candidates, please enter that question into the chat tonight. So we have four of the candidates here this evening. Uh, there are five total candidates in all. We did invite Mayor Stockman to find our invitation this evening. So we will get started. We'll start with the candidates. Please introduce yourself, explain who you are, uh, explain your relevant experience and why you want to be the mayor of Omaha. Each of you will have 60 seconds to introduce yourself. We'll start with you, Thank you, Delon. Thank you, Delon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jasmine Harris. I am a public health expert and community organizer, born and raised here in North Omaha. I am running for mayor of Omaha because I'm a firm believer that everyday people have the solutions to the challenges that our city is facing. I don't say that just because I'm dedicated my career to addressing these challenges, but because I have lived through and persevered through many of them in my own life. There are too many of the same challenges that I faced as a single Black mother over 19 years ago that continue to hold our city back. We have too many Omaha struggling to make ends meet, and our city leadership has failed to address the most basic of those challenges that continue to impact our city, our family, our friends, and our neighbors. After graduating from UNMC with my master's in public health, I began to focus on underlying conditions that impact the quality of life of Omaha residents. Through that work, I became a proven leader of people. I've been organizing and mobilizing individuals and organizations to create change in our community. And that's the experience that I will bring. Thank you, Lord. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for attending tonight. I'm more cudgel, and uh, you know, I, I was not sitting around looking for an office to run for. But uh, like so many grassroots campaigns, I had uh, a couple of friends over, colleagues of mine who we were sitting on my front porch and doing what teachers do, uh, trying to figure out how to make the world better for our children. And that's that's the short answer to why I'm running for mayor. I joke that I must have drawn the, the short straw uh, among the three of us because I wound up the candidate. We just want to see the world better for our children. I have two kids of my own, Titus and Zoe, and uh, I've got thousands of former students, and all of them deserve a brighter future than Omaha is currently uh, heading for us. So, uh, again, I'm Mark, I'm running for mayor, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Devon. And thank you, um, Web Omaha, Spark City, our Ann Hartman Worker Center for um, providing the opportunity for people to hear from us this evening. My name is Kimberly Snipe, and I am running to, for a mayor of Omaha. 
I currently serve on the Omaha Public School Board. I'm also president of the South Omaha Neighborhood Alliance. I actually have to serve on the advisory board for uh, an Omaha. I'm also on the board of the Rector's Core Partners and Corporate Center. Um, as far as qualifications, um, being on the school board where we serve over 52,000 students, so there's only three cities in Nebraska that have the amount of people within the district to open the pack. Um, we have a budget that is larger than the city of Omaha general fund. Outside of that, I connected with South Omaha Neighborhood Alliance. With neighborhood associations in Omaha, Nebraska, especially as someone who thinks in leadership within that organization. I would say that last year, when COVID began to shut the city down, um, I was out front early addressing high risk black and brown communities based off of what I was seeing happening across the world, um, happening here in the nation as well. The city should not have to wait on leadership. It is not the reason why I'm running to be Omaha next year. Thank you, Juan, and thank you for hosting this event tonight and moderating it. I'm RJ Neary. I'm running for mayor. I've spent my, I've lived most of my life in Omaha, and I've spent the last 40 years in business, creating jobs, creating opportunities, helping neighborhoods, and making expansion for our city. And and I've done that for large businesses and small. I've worked at City Hall on planning board and other committees. And I see so much potential in our city that we're not living up to. I'm running for mayor because my path forward and my plans for Omaha will leave our city for a better place for the next generation. I look forward to discussing these issues with other candidates tonight and with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we will get into four of our questions focusing on equity and development. And each candidate will get 90 seconds to answer each of these questions. So the first question, uh, some parts of Omaha are experiencing tremendous growth in terms of economic and community development. However, large parts of our city have seen zero development or investment through multiple decades. In addition to this neglect in older parts of the city, there are now parts of the inner suburbs, such as Miller and the Old Mill, that are experiencing growing income inequality and black. What are you going to do to stop the growing income inequality throughout the neighborhoods in the city of Omaha? We'll start with you. To get at income inequality, the first thing that we have to do is get at the root of the problem. Right? I've heard people float ideas about things like raising the minimum wage. You cannot do that with a municipality. All of our businesses will simply relocate to Pavilion and Bellevue and Ralston. So what we have to do instead is to make sure that we're taking care of our people in the neighborhoods that they live in. And we can do that strategically. And the first thing that we have to do is to make sure that people have the ability to go to college and get an education so that they can get the careers that they want. And that's not just university, that's, that's trade school as well. And my Omaha Promise policy, which you can find on our webpage, tells you exactly how my administration is going to make sure that that happens. Every last high school student and graduate in Omaha, Nebraska, will have the ability to go to college and get their degree and graduate debt free. Those people will then stay here and live the lives and have the careers that they've always wanted. The other thing we have to do is work harder to develop the neighborhoods that they live in. I know that that comes up later, but there are a lot of things that we can do a lot of things that we can help uh, you know, shore up neighborhoods and, and build in them and develop them and put resources, time and money and energy into those neighborhoods. What are you going to do to stop the growing income inequality around neighborhoods in the city of Omaha? Thank you. Um, while I agree in that some of this is not left up to the mayor to do by themselves, I would also say that the mayor is someone who's in a position to be an advocate for people. Um, when it comes to equity within the city, something that I've heard continuously from people is just not even listening. I think first you have to listen and understand what those needs are. As someone who lives in a concentrated area of poverty, and I'm witness to this every day. Um, we have to have those conversations. My plan is to create a panel. Um, that will include workforce development leaders, labor leaders, education leaders to start having these really intentional conversations on how we work with the um, mayor's office, how we work with the state and others to really have these conversations on how we address this issue. It's not something that the mayor does by themselves. It takes unity and she's right to sit at the table to address it. Thank you. 
income inequality is happening throughout Omaha. And the city needs to do its part to eliminate that. And in my plan, my path forward, I have a plan for new affordable housing because everybody deserves affordable and safe housing. It's essential to raising our kids and every kid having a fair chance. Back in the 1980s, I was on the first Habitat for Humanity board and I've helped build houses almost every year since and trying to create uh, regeneration of neighborhoods and safe, affordable housing for all for families. It makes a huge difference in the outcomes of family life. And I will build, I will work to build a more robust transportation system because we have too many people spending too much money on transportation in our city. So thank you. Thank you for the question, Delmont. Um, what we need to do is be intentional. Where we spend our money is uh, where our priorities are. So we need to intentionally invest into our communities and neighborhoods that have been left out of the development processes over the years. Um, how we're building up downtown, we need plans for our neighborhoods that work in that same manner. We also need to connect our neighborhoods and corridors with a better transportation system, but not only just relying on uh, buses. We need to ensure that we are addressing uh, the multiple uh, modes of transportation in our community that are going to get people from point A to point B. When we're talking about an income inequality, we do have to address those underlying uh, conditions um, that we are not taking care of. We need to look at what are our working um, abilities for the pipelines to those high demand, high wage, high um, skilled jobs and ensuring that we are preparing our youth and our young people to stay here to fill those jobs. Thank you. Moving on to our second question. Uh, talking about community, community development block grants, they are a tool that the city can use to provide subsidies to developers for building affordable housing and to create economic opportunities for low and moderate income residents. Unlike other subsidies such as TIP, which are established by state law and the mayor of Omaha oversees the allocation of community block grants, how would you use funds like this to address the urgent needs of the community? Well, right now, um, our urgent need is housing. We are literally in a crisis. I was speaking with your executive the other day who went into her housing guru, and she told me at that moment in time, we were close to almost 79,000 79, um, homes for a shortage of homes. So one of the first things I can look into that. Um, that's a major crisis. Um, I am someone who has worked with a lot of people I know, people I represent on the school board, um, neighborhoods that are looking for affordable housing as well. So the first thing to me is really starting to look and address that crisis. Thank you. 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 renovation of neighborhoods and creating jobs and opportunities for people throughout our city. I've been involved with them, but it's not only the community block grants, it's the leadership that a mayor needs to show in leading our community and focusing on the needs where market doesn't meet the needs and that the city has to intervene and help our neighborhoods thrive. It's something I've done. I've done it at the Creighton St. Joe Hospital where we created 700 units. And I'm so proud of that because we reconnected the east side and west sides of, of the freeway with a bridge so that the neighborhoods could be connected. And that's what this is about, is reconnecting all of our parts of our city and creating more housing units, which is in my path plan of, for a path forward for a better Omaha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, housing is the number one crisis that we are facing right now that we do need to address. The community uh, block grant dollars can be used on things like housing, streets and sidewalks, 
But what we need to really start addressing is the shortage of units and the quality of those units that we have. We also need to um, look outside of um, what we're saying, rental units um, and, and what's being available there. We have to start looking at starter homes as well. There are only 500 um, houses available on the for sale market in our area. And that is not enough to um, ensure that our families here have places to move to and then we're trying to attract people to come to our city. So we should use those CBDG uh, dollars to ensure that we are addressing our housing. Thank you. I suppose it's the shortcoming of going last. I'm not going to say a whole lot that you haven't already heard. The, the, the huge issue that we have to deal with right now is, is housing and the housing shortage. Um, but I think that we need to get a little more nuanced about what we're talking about when we look at affordable housing. Um, the Juan Hayes, who I like a lot, always says, you know, affordable for whom? I don't know how many times I've heard him say that. I think that's a really important question. What I can afford, you may not be able to. You may be able to afford something much more than I can. So when we're talking about building housing. We need to be building low-income housing, mixed-income housing, middle-income housing, and incentivizing that building using these grants. The other thing that I think we have to think about with these particular grants is that we have hundreds of neighborhoods in this city and that their needs and the needs of the people that live in them are unique. And I think it's really important for the person, in this case, the mayor who's administering these grants, to go first to those people and say, what is it you need? Rather than attempting to prescribe something to them and say, tell us what your needs are, and we have some money to help you meet them. You know, I, I often ask, why have a city government if it doesn't help the people in the city? And this is one of the ways which we can directly do. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and speaking of um, affordable housing, we we'll talk about gentrification for a second. So as investment occurs throughout the city's urban core, there is the potential for the displacement of existing residents, especially marginalized communities, through, through increased rents and property taxes. What actions will you take to limit this displacement or gentrification and to use this investment to economically empower existing residents? Thank you. Gentrification is a real issue for many neighborhoods, and the downside is that it displaces people that have been a fabric of that neighborhood for years and, and probably generations. And they've shopped and churched and prayed and studied and raised their kids in those neighborhoods and gone to the parks and everything else. And so it it's not a good model when you completely gentrify a neighborhood and run the people that have been there for generations out. And we can do things to keep people in their homes and keep people in their neighborhoods so that these neighborhoods are stabilized and yet they can enjoy some reinvestment which helps all citizens and all uh, people that live in the neighborhood. So as mayor, I would ensure, and when I'm mayor, I will ensure that we gentrification doesn't create less affordable housing, we create more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need to ensure that we have the welcoming and the inclusivity that is going to make sure that gentrification does not continue. When talking to people across the city, North and South Side for sure, they are really concerned about being priced out of the areas that they have lived in. And we need to um, start making a strategic plan when we are addressing how we are talking about quality, affordable housing, holding landlords to those safe and health standards. We have room for everyone. And as people are coming in and developing, we need to ensure that we are using that um, the incentives that we can that there are going to be affordable housing units in the developments that are uh, being brought. Again, it's all about intentionality. And then we have to think innovatively around it. We need to start ensuring that our housing is connected to the transportation, which is connected to the jobs. And that what that looks like is our infill. We have to start looking at things like tiny homes and auxiliary dwelling units. So that way people don't have to leave out um, to areas where they don't have access to the transportation and they can still be in the heart where they can afford. Thank you. 
one of the things I think we have to do as a municipality is to begin to examine the things that are within our control. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we can do is we look at gentrification as an issue and try to combat that is, is to think about our tax rates. Uh, an awful lot of people uh, move to council bluffs, and I don't think it's because they want to stay there from council bluffs. Uh, I think it's because they don't want to pay the taxes here anymore. Um, when you look at valuations, I've seen the valuations on so many houses spiking, and, and all of a sudden, right, escrow goes up and you can't afford to live in the place that you bought. Where you can't afford to rent it anymore because the landlord took the price up. And those are parts of the things that we're talking about. We talk about gentrification. But, you know, another thing that's been stuck in my craw for, for quite a while now is, you know, as we talk about empowering people economically, is where the jobs are, right? The, the fulfillment center that was just built by Amazon and Papillion, this is, this is hundreds of jobs. Right, and, and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars being pumped into Papillion is reaping the benefits of being next to Omaha, right? And here's what I'll tell you. When I'm mayor, the next one of those things that gets built, we can't move that, but when I'm mayor, the next one of those that gets built is going to get built in North Omaha. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. It's very interesting that you asked that. Um, as right now, within my own neighborhood, literally, in my backyard, um, we are preparing for a major uh, multi-million dollar redevelopment that's happening, um, something very similar to what happened in North Omaha. I think one of the first things that you have to do is get people involved um, and make sure that people are represented and their voices are heard. You also have to educate people on these processes, and you have to utilize what we have as well. And when we talk about root causes, um, jobs, you know, building up those skills, like Jesse was talking about, the H3 the high skill, high wage, and high demand, make sure we're prepared people for that so they are able to afford homes. One of the things I've been talking with Canopy South, who was in charge of the HUD redevelopment in my own neighborhood is, how do we not just um, come in and, and build mixed income homes or apartments or things like that? How do we intentionally work with people to get them put on the pathway to home ownership? Why don't we find an opportunity to put people on the pathway to legacy wealth? So that way it doesn't matter where they want to live, they can afford it no matter where. Thank you, each of you, for that. Uh, now we're going to move on to questions focused on public transit and streets. And again, each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer these final questions. So the first question. In a recent survey for the Connect Go initiative, the Greater Omaha Chamber collected data showing constituents would like the city to create policies connecting neighborhoods through biking, transit, and other mobility forms besides regular vehicles. How familiar are you with, with the Chamber's Connect Go initiative? And what role do you see the city exercising uh, with initiatives of this type of scale? We'll start with you, Thank you. Um, I am familiar with the Connect Go as I participated in both of the surveys that have happened right now. And for me, the city should be the number one partner as the chamber is working on this. Um, they are doing this right, getting the information from people who are using the services, people who are uh, providers of services for other individuals, because they know how this impacts everyday people. And I've always said, everyday people have the solutions to the challenges that our city is facing. So the city needs to take a proactive approach and be that partner who is going to start looking at this from a holistic standpoint. When we're talking about ensuring that we have complete streets, when we are talking about vision zero, we need to ensure that we have put people, bikes, and uh, vehicles all on equal footing. So what that looks like is making sure we have bikeability, walkability, and this um, initiative that the chamber is endeavoring on is great, and I believe that the city should be right there alongside him. If I leave my home to go to Omaha North, where I teach, and I take my car, I can get there in nine minutes. If I take my bike, I can get there in 22 minutes, but I won't be on bike paths for more than a couple of miles. If I take the bus, it'll take me 45. So when people say, well, nobody uses the buses, how do you talk about funding them so much? Why do you want to pump so much money into Metro? If the buses worked better, and it's not Metro's fault, they're underfunded, but if the buses worked better, people would use it. Improving public transportation is a huge issue for our city, and it's a part of the brain drain that we talk about so often. We have to do better for public transportation and for walkability and bikeability 
accessibility like Jasmine was talking about. Uh, Connect Go, I think, was a really good first step. It gives us a foundation. It gives us some information that we need. Um, we have to keep going. We have to do better by Metro as it becomes a regional transit authority. We have to start offering protected bike lanes and more of them, and we have to connect. We have to take care of our sidewalks, right? We have to make sure that our, our streets are accessible and not just to cars. So ultimately, I think the city needs to sit down. As mayor, I'll be happy to be at the head of that table with the chamber, with organizations like Mode Shift, uh, with Metro, and together, We'll make a plan for everybody in the city to be able to get where they need to go quickly and efficiently. Thank you. Um, you know, um, I am a public transit user. The only reason why I'm not today is because I'm lucky enough for my brother to let me use his name. Um, you know, what we don't practice enough here is collaboration. In 2017, I went down to Mount because as a business services consultant for Heartland Workforce Solutions, I was having a horrible time getting people to work. And it baffled me the lack of connection between the city, the chamber, and MAPA. It's going a lot better now, but we have to get in the practice of not thinking we know everything and working with the people who are the experts. Um, I take, I've taken that survey as well. I think it's a really great survey. It's not the first one that I've taken. We also have to get ourselves to the point where we are really um, pushing through with actionable steps. I serve on the board for motion. When we talk about uh, multiple modes of transportation, exactly, but we also have to educate people on what that looks like, how to use it, et cetera. We talk about the bike lanes, which are great. I saw them at the 130th Street, but I barely see them getting used. Let's also educate people on what that looks like. If you've seen my TV and you've seen me bike, and I've biked all over Omaha in the last couple of years so that I could see actually what's happening and how it's happening or not happening. And it's not happening. I've been part of the ConnectGo trip to Minneapolis to see their systems of transportation. I've been on the Transportation Oriented Development Committee. I know this subject, I'm passionate about it. And I know how disconnected our bike trails are, how you can't get from one neighborhood to another. I say, let's get more go in the Connect Go. <clears throat> and get things happening. And the surveys, I've talked to civic leaders, I've talked to developers, and the and they're, they want less studies and more action. And we've just had no action and not getting anything done with the leadership we currently have. So as mayor, I'm going to invest in multiple forms of transportation and street systems so that we'll have a dynamic transportation system in Omaha. Thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, we are in uh, optimal season, so talking about uh, road repair. Last year, voters approved a five-year, $200 million transportation bond issue, uh, which will fund the city's first pavement maintenance program. This bond will fund road repairs through 2025. Although this bond will fund street repairs for five years, it will be paid off over 20 years so that the tax increase is used to pay it back on to its strength. Whoever is elected mayor in 2021 will have to decide how much of the bond issue money is spent. And amid rising infrastructure costs, one challenge the next mayor will face is using the funds for the bond effectively. How will you address street repair using the bond funds in a comprehensive and equitable way without putting further financial burden on residents? And how will this look different in different parts? Well, I'll start the city just effectively paid for our groceries with a high interest credit card. And we needed those groceries, but we're gonna be paying them off for an awful long time, right? We just paid for five years worth of road repair, as you pointed out, and we're gonna be paying for it for 20 years. We can't afford to continue to blunder along with streets like this. Our roads, roads are thousands of years old as technology. We live in the one city that can't get them right. It's astonishing. We have to start managing our streets using a little bit of common sense. 
Uh, if you'll check out the road policy on my on my web page, you'll, you'll see more about what I'm suggesting. But a few things. Number one, we got to stop widening the streets. Anybody who has ever read a traffic study knows that that does not decrease congestion. Full stop. Uh, what it does do is make the road more expensive to maintain. And we already can't afford to maintain the roads we have, which is why we also need to stop annexing everything we can get our hands on. It's more roads, it's more sewers, and we can't pay the bills we have, and we just took on far more. So we have to start managing this city, and that includes our roads, with a little bit of common sense. This is a huge issue. It's, it's a hazard to people driving all over the place. RJ, your, your people posted on Instagram today that were driving through the town and, and blew, blew a tire in a bottle. This is a dumb problem for us to have in 2021, and we can fix it, but we have to use our best. Um, yeah, I just had a tire blown out of my car a few weeks ago, um, hitting a pothole. You know, I went and talked with some of the city workers, and what I want to do is, and I, I, I like the way Mr. Dutton put that, what we've always said is that, you know, you don't take out a loan to paint the walls in your house, right? Um, but what I would say is that, you know, I've talked to city workers, and what we have to do is do things the right way the first time and quit cutting the road. And, and that's what the problem is. So we have to look at that budget line by line, figure out where we're wasting money, where it's being spent right, not, um, um, I won't say that. But yeah, we have to look at that budget. We have to do things the right way the first time. My mother seems to say something, and, and I won't say it here because it's not appropriate, but you can't half do this. And that means our streets too. Thank you. Thank you. Mark's right, one of our campaign workers blew a tire in our, one of our potholes. And we've all done that. Yes, when I went to the tire store several months ago and saw a bubble on the side of my tire and the tire guy said, that's from a pothole. It's one of the reasons people don't stay in Omaha. The one neighbors, they, they just guess the date when the pothole shows up every spring. because It's the same thing. It's fixed, pothole, fixed, pothole, and it's a bad system. And it's a mess. And we've had the same mess for eight years. And the current administration says, we cut your taxes, we cut your taxes. Well, if they did buy a pizza, and then the streets fell apart. And now they're raising the taxes by much more. And it's not sustainable. And we're annexing 20-year-old SIDs that have 20-year-old streets, and according to the city, the streets only last 20 years. So we can build a better street. I've studied this issue. I know this issue. I've talked to the contractors and engineers that know how we can fix and build a better street with better materials and create drainage, drainage, drainage. I'm in the commercial real estate business. They talk about location, location, location. With streets, it's drainage, drainage, drainage. Thank you. When I decided to run for office, um, about 95% of people asked me, so what are you gonna run on? Streets or trash? <laughs> we are doing this all along. We should not be talking about the pothole in the streets every time election cycle uh, comes around. Our city leadership has failed in this part, and they put it on the people to vote for a $200 million uh, bond to pay for this. And the people are so tired of their streets being the way that they are, of course, we're going to vote to have our streets fixed. What we need to do is look no further than Lincoln and what they're doing. I've talked to uh, an individual who spent their entire life working on uh, concrete, and what he said is that we need quality material. What are we doing with our materials here? So that's the first thing we need to analyze. And then the technique needs to be there. When you're pouring it, it needs to be a specific technique. And when it is a freeze-thaw cycle, we need to make sure that we do have that drainage. So ensuring that we have the right people in our works department to ensure we are using the right materials and the right technique will take us a long time. Right All right, so moving on to our next round now, uh, we'll focus on a, a number of different issues that will come up with the mayor's next term. 
Each candidate will have 60 seconds in this round to respond to each question. So the first question, uh, currently the only consistent chance residents have to interact with the mayor is the mayor's hotline. Do you think that's a sufficient engagement or a, a sufficient way to engage with the mayor? Uh, and what is your plan for community engagement during your time in this year? It's not too much. It's absolutely not, and I hate to put Alexis on the spot, but I definitely want to work with all of our alliance leaders as an alliance leader myself. Um, Omaha, Nebraska has six neighborhood alliances, and these alliances act as neighborhood, act as umbrella of sort of organizations for the neighborhood association that exists within their boundaries. And so we have a community liaison. I see this person as being someone who can convene these alliance leaders together and then working with organizations like One Omaha to put on forums across the entire city on a regular basis. Our mayor needs to be involved with neighborhoods, needs to be at that level, listening and understanding so they truly, truly know what's happening and they have those lines of communication open and they remain. Uh, the mayor's hotline is nowhere near enough for that type of communication. When I'm mayor, I will have a much more open policy one of my strengths is collaborating and bringing people together. A city councilman, a, a former city councilman called the mayor's hotline a mayor's lukewarm line because it takes, if you call the mayor's hotline, it has to go through five or six steps to get to the guy that comes out and fixes your bottle. It shouldn't be that difficult. There's technology that we can do to help citizens uh, be more engaged with City Hall. And I'm gonna have community connections where we're gonna meet every two couple months and talk about things that are going on in our communities in all parts of town. Thank you. Thank you. The mayor's hotline is not an effective way. Um, we've talked to people whose numbers have actually been blocked from the mayor's hotline and that is unacceptable. What we need to do is ensure that we have a mass communication system in place that we can get information out to people. We need an updated website as of yesterday. And uh, what we uh, also need is for uh, people to be able to talk to the department in like the, the human rights, uh, the human relations department, the city works department. So under my administration, we will have open access so that people can actually talk to our uh, department heads, that we are actually hearing from people. I want to put in an innovation and engagement hub. So that way, at the center of everything, everyday people will be able to bring their solutions to the challenges that we face. The first thing I think the mayor needs to do is be present uh, in terms of communication and not just in the neighborhoods in which they live. Uh, as mayor, I want to be out and around people all of the time, accessible to my constituents, whether they voted for me or not. Uh, my campaign has worked hard to model government transparency from the beginning. Uh, we have currently a podcast and a newsletter that I hope you'll check out. And you know, I think that that needs to continue into office. And we'll continue to have a podcast for the city and the newsletter and make sure that people are getting the information about the city that they need. Uh, my webpage is currently available in seven languages. Again, Jasmine, you're right. It needs to be revamped. The city's webpage needs to be redone and it needs to be accessible to everybody who lives. And the other thing is that we need to stop holding uh, the state of the city address and city council meetings at the time that we are most convinced the fewest people will come. And that's something I'll make sure happens as well. Thank you. Continuing on with the discussion about engagement, talking about engagement with the Parks Department, uh, hearing, hearing uh, concerns or comments from residents, whether it be having to take upon themselves to clean trash, uh, cleaning up down limbs in neighborhood parks, or lack of engagement around planning and design in parks, or lack of support for resident led amenities in parks, uh, such as the 20th Street State Park and Lynch Park. Uh, what will you do to encourage more engagement with neighbors and support for resident led projects in neighborhood parks? We have 200 and some park, 240 some parks in Omaha, and they're not being cared for. Uh, neighbor, and there's nothing more proud for Omahans than what park they live near. I live near Elmwood Park, I live near Benson Park. Everybody has their park that they brag about living by. 
And <clears throat> it's essential that we engage these neighborhood organizations and empower the neighborhood organizations to be very involved. And they shouldn't have to be picking up limbs and doing all the cleanup in our parks. That's part of the problem of trying to grow our city without the funding that we have to do it. And when I'm mayor, we will fund the cleanup of these parks and keep them in better shape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, the work that I've been doing in the community uh, previously is we were always out doing park cleanups and we run that into the campaign. So we're going around it and doing park cleanups. And what we know that is out there are resources. There are uh, nonprofits and other organizations who are actually able to supply um, the uh, kits and things like that to go around and clean up. I'm a firm believer that if someone has uh, skin in the game, if you will, if they uh, feel like they're a part of something, they're going to build it up, they're going to keep it beautiful. We just need to connect them to the resources that are already out there. Because even our parks department will, if you call them, will come bring the uh, utensils and tools that you need to do a cleanup. I think that is a great way for people to be involved in their community and show pride in their community. So it's just connecting people to the right resources. You know, I, I think that parks are something that our municipality and probably many others pay a lot of lip service to, uh, but, but don't seem to follow through. And it seems to me like the maintenance of our parks is, is often left to the work of nonprofit organizations and individuals. And, and it's the responsibility of the city to take care of them. So in, in regard to that lip service, you know, I tell people, don't, don't tell me what you value. Tell me how you spend your money. Tell me how you spend your time, and I'll know what you value. Well, a lot of our residents, an awful lot of our residents, spend their time in those parks. And so the values of the municipality need to catch up. And we need to make sure that we are funding the maintenance of those parks as a city to make sure that they're available to all of our thousands of residents who rely upon them and want to use them. Um, so I would say, sorry, the rhymes threw me off. <laughs> There's something called asset-based community development. When you go into a community, regardless of what type of community it is, like my own, which um, is a racially and or ethnically concentrated area of poverty, it still has assets. Um, there are physical assets, and one of those are our parks, public spaces. Um, I would say when I hold a formal spring of parks director with me, the new one that we have, I would also say, like Jasmine mentioned, we have organizations here. Highland South Indian Hills, we have been performing neighborhood cleanups, park cleanups for years. We work with Keep Omaha Beautiful. They come in and they support us with that. But we also have to educate people. One of the things I've been talking to Keep Omaha Beautiful about is how can we work with Southside Terrace to educate people on why we should be better, to educate people why it's important to keep our public spaces beautiful. Thank you. Another issue that many residents who are engaged in their neighborhood space is navigating local resources to assist their homeless neighbors without calling police. What will your administration do to provide more support for people navigating resources? Um, do you have a plan to address the root causes of homelessness here in Omaha? Thank you. We have to uh, look at the upstream causes, uh, the root causes, the underlying conditions, and why people are facing um, homelessness. We have so many organizations within our city who are combating this. We have together. We have um, Sienna, for instance. We have Habitat for Humanity. We really need to start collaborating more and leaning into our partners who are the experts in this to address that. What I will do is create a task force of our partners, of people who have been impacted by homelessness, so that way we can have an actual plan that is going to address our uh, homeless situations. We have to decriminalize homelessness as well. When we're talking about the panhandling ordinance that is out there. We cannot keep uh, ensuring that when people aren't uh, able to pay for things or they're asking for the money that we're going to call the police in. So we need to one, look at prevention of that and then to decriminalize homelessness. Thank you. Thanks. You know, I, I got a text from a friend the other day who was quite distraught. She was telling me about the 10th Street Bridge, where a number of, of unhoused people had been had been staying 
and um, and often were. And she would take them water and ask them if they needed things. And they were always so kind to her. And what she found is that they were recently cleared out and there was a fence built there so they couldn't stay there anymore. First damn thing we need to do is start treating people with a little bit of respect. Start treating our fellow human beings like they matter. And then absolutely, we need to get at the causes. We need to destigmatize mental illness in this country. It's far overdue. We need to make sure that housing is available and affordable for everybody in the city who wants it. And the first thing I'm gonna do it, day one thing I'm gonna do in City Hall, is get rid of that stupid panhandling ordinance. We have no right to tell the people who need the most help that they're the ones who aren't allowed to ask for it. We can do better. It starts by treating our fellow human beings with respect. I agree. Um, Omaha, Nebraska, we have the resources that we need. Omaha is a philanthropic city. I cannot express that enough. We have to find a way. We keep talking about addressing these root causes. Work with the nonprofits that we have here and the experts we have here to address this issue. Get the people who know what they are talking about to sit together at a table somewhere and work this out. It might be difficult. It might take a little while. This is a marathon and not a race, but we have to get the right people together. We cannot arrest our way out of this issue. We have to address mental health. We have to address housing. Um, but I think the most important thing is providing space with the right people to really address the issue, the right people and organizations, because we have them here to really address this issue. Okay. Thank you. Creating homes and safe homes for people is a priority, and it should be for every city, and it should be, it will solve a lot of problems if we solve it. As I said, I was on the original Habitat for Humanity board in Omaha, and I learned a lot of things about trying to grow that organization, and now it's one of our largest home builders. So we need organizations like that, and organizations that keep people in their homes, especially during pandemics, and we, we cannot tolerate the landlords that do not care for their properties and end up kicking people out after evictions. So when I'm mayor, we'll work on this issue and we'll create more supply of affordable housing and we'll solve this problem upstream. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our final, our, our, excuse me, final question in this round is about the Home Rule City Charter. It's a document that outlines the roles and responsibilities of the different elected officials and departments in our municipal government. According to the charter, there must be a convention held every 10 years to review and amend it. Uh, it's a role of the city council to call for the convention and select committee members in concurrence with the mayor. The last convention was held in 2013, being the next convention to be after that last convention, Mayor Jane Stockwell felt that not enough had been done to update the charter during the convention. What will you do to influence the next convention and make sure it is fruitful? And what kind of updates to the charter do you think need to be made? Mr. President, you. Um, I'm sure there are an awful lot of updates that need to be made to the charter, and I look forward to being part of that. But there are two that are written into my plans. I want to touch on quickly. The first thing that we absolutely must do, the first policy that we ever wrote, is we have to move these elections. Our election is in 13 days from tonight, on April the 6th, for no good reason. And the following one will be May the 11th, again, for no good reason. And this costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars and succeeds in suppressing voter turnout dramatically. That absolutely has to change and it's not a difficult thing to change we can make them coincide with the presidential election the other thing that i want to see done in the charter is to reinstate civilian oversight of the police uh, as a teacher i answer to a school board in that vein one of my bosses is right here tonight um, the police and fire need to answer to to the boards as well there needs to be a civilian oversight board and they need to be responsible uh, to the people that they protect and so that we can write in the charter. Thank you. I have to touch on that civilian oversight. I agree 100%. Um, one of my uh, things I want to do first thing is to really create this um, commission, this review commission, to really address how we restore public trust. Um, last year showed us that the city was disconnected. 
the mayor's office was disconnected, and public trust is something that's extremely important. When it comes to reducing crime in the city, the only people who solve crime, well, the police do, but they can't do it without the support of the people. And the people are not going to do it if trust is not restored. So that would be where I would start. Thank you. Thank you for that question. In addition to changing elections, and it's my understanding that the city charter doesn't have to be every 10 years, it can be sooner than 10 years. Um, and I would propose that we may speed that up to 2022, that we would move the elections to be with the presidential election. And we need to review to make sure our, our city council districts still accurately uh, are equitable and sized properly and, and, and designed properly to be uh, equitable throughout our city. And when I'm mayor, I'm gonna have an equity officer in my cabinet, and we're gonna make sure that all these decisions and the, that the charter will be reviewed with an equity lens. Thank you. Ms. Gibbs. I think the number one thing we need to do when it comes to this convention of uh, the charter is to ensure that the people of Omaha know what it is, when it is, and what they can actually change with it and advocate for that. That is one of the biggest things we have been talking about. The people of Omaha feel disconnected and left out of anything that the local government is doing. And we need to ensure that we are bringing our community members to City Hall so that we can build an Omaha that is going to work for everyone. This convention just cannot be the city council members and the mayor saying this is what needs to change. It needs to be everyone at the table saying this is how we move Omaha forward and this is how we can change it within our charter. And to what everyone was saying, yes, we need independent police oversight. We need to move our elections and we do need to come through our charters, our policies and our procedures with an equity lens. And that's what I plan to do as mayor. So our uh, next round of questions will be from you, our viewers, uh, and each candidate will get 60 seconds to respond to the question. Again, these questions coming from you, our viewers. First question, uh, how would you balance decision-making when it comes to neighborhood needs and desires versus city planning and uh, developing? This will be directed at you. Um, you, have to, you have to include the people. This just point blank period. You have to include the people. And so what I've been hearing constantly from people, regardless of what part of Hong Kong they live in, it's just not real intentional listening happening. And so again, working with our neighborhood associations, which already exists, working to educate them within that, really utilizing that as an opportunity, a tool to really communicate with people so that you can understand um, what people are saying, what people are going through in the situation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Neighborhoods are vital to making the right thing happen and listening to those neighborhoods associations. But that starts with having a current directory of the neighborhood associations, and which we don't have right now, and and supplying some organizational uh, support to our neighborhood associations. One of the things we do in our city is we spend two hundred fifty thousand a year for engineers to run around and make sure the snow removal is done. When I'm mayor, we're going to make give the the organizations like One Omaha and uh, those funding through helping us solve the neighborhood problems rather than giving it to people that sometimes don't even, uh, their home office isn't even in Omaha. So we're going to empower those neighborhood associations and support them with good support. Thank you. Yes, yes. People elect officials to make the decisions at the end of the day. But what we need for elected officials to understand is that we have to listen to the community. We have to listen to people who have been impacted by whatever that challenge is, and we have to listen to the experts in that uh, area as well. 
So you have to balance it by being able to be a great active listener, being able to be open-minded to learn, and then making the decision that's going to be best for everyone based on the information that has been received. That's what um, I've been always saying. I'm a firm believer that everyday people have the solutions to the challenges that our city is facing. We just need to ensure that our elected officials are actually listening. I think as a teacher, and I don't think this is unique to my profession, uh, one of my very favorite things is when people come to me and say, this is what your problem is, now let me tell you how to fix it. Um, it that, that happens far too frequently. Uh, I'm on the board of the Homeowners Association in, in Field Club where I live, and we have unique issues and, and unique things that make our neighborhood wonderful. But those things are very different from those faced by the Anson Park neighborhood immediately adjacent. And so, you know, Kimber said we have to include the people, and she's exactly right. It's, it's about sitting down and listening to what individuals and, and the individuals that make up neighborhoods say they need, and then using the immense resources of the municipality to effectively meet those needs. Our next question from our viewers at the end is, how will you support small businesses and entrepreneurs? And we will begin with I've been supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs my entire career. One, and as mayor, we're going to remove obstacles to creating small businesses in the new North neighborhood in North downtown. We've created 15 or 20 new businesses by providing a creative, collaborative area for them to be in. And we're gonna do that throughout the city where we have, a, especially where we have a lot of vacant former commercial buildings. And we're gonna make those available to entrepreneurs and small businesses and empower them because that's where most of the jobs and most of the wealth is created. Thank you. Thank you. We have to be intentional in our investments. We have uh, small businesses owned by uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are having a um, hard time getting access to capital to start their business. So we need to be intentional in how we're investing into our small businesses. But we also need to do a streamline the processes for people who are starting businesses, who have businesses that are up and running. We need to ensure that there's a portal where they can connect to um, getting their licenses and renewing their licenses or things that need to happen like that. But also be able to tap into technical assistance because what we see are these silos of organizations that work on entrepreneurship and small businesses. And we need to create a streamlined process where everyone is working together and can tap into those resources. Perfect. Thank you. So my parents owned a tiny bookstore in Valentine, Nebraska. They opened it more than 30 years ago, uh, before Amazon came around. But when Amazon came around and you could get prime shipping to your house and it was delivered quickly and it was usually discounted, the people in the town had a choice that they wouldn't have a bookstore or not because if the shop at Amazon, they weren't going to have one. Our government wastes a lot of time with lip service, talking about what we're going to support. Oh, this is what I value and this is what I care about. And like I said before, Tell me how you spend your money and I'll tell you what you care about. So the policy that we wrote on small businesses that we'll enact from day one is going to be that we're going to preference local contractors at every opportunity. Uh, one of the ways I framed that is that there's just never going to be any Folgers freeze-dried coffee served in City Hall because we have coffee roasters in this city, right? Until Budweiser wants to brew Bud Light in this city, then the Benson Brewery's stuff is going to get consumed in City Hall as well. And so, and, and even after that. So we need to make sure that we're supporting our local small businesses, not with words, but with money and actual support. Um, I think one of the first places to start is to make city contracts more accessible. And then also I mentioned earlier, the mayor being an applicant. Um, the mayor can work with the chamber. The mayor can work with the reach program. Um, who wants to build capacity? The mayor can reach out to Nebraska Enterprise Fund. To be a support. Also, there's a lot of things going on right now in the state legislature, um, working with our state senators, just working with anyone, again, when it comes to really solving and addressing these issues. There are things happening 
Um, Omaha, the state, we have support to the place. Um, we have new people coming in regarding economic development from the state level that are going to be placed right in North Omaha. We'll be working with those organizations um, um, to be a support. Thank you. I have a final question from the viewers tonight. How will you involve residents in the process of creating the budget? And we'll start with this case. Thank you. Um, this past summer, when everyone started actually galvanizing and being involved and engaged in how things were happening in our city, it made me proud to see people show up to talk about this budget at the budget meeting. But when we started showing up, we already knew it was too late. So what we need to do is include people from the beginning when we are already knowing that budgets need to roll out and setting up a process for people to get involved. With the innovation and community engagement hub that I want to create, there will be a process for people to know what is actually going on with that budget and even setting up participatory budgeting, which means people of Omaha will get to decide where some of the money actually goes into the resources and services that we provide. Um, unlike the federal government, uh, the city government and municipal government can't go into debt. Uh, we sure seem willing and able to, to strap our people with more and more taxes that they can't afford and do foolish things like extend them over 20 years. But ultimately, we can't get away from it with this for very long. And it has to stop. So, you know, one of the things I think that has to happen with the city budget is it has to be made accessible to all the people. When I declared my candidacy shortly after that, a friend of mine who, who holds office locally handed me a, a copy of the city's budget. And I, I can barely lift the darn thing. It's a tome. It's, it's 450 pages of gobbledygook that nobody in their right mind, except maybe me, is going to bother to read. We have to make the information inside of that accessible to the people, let people know how the money is being spent. And then, yes, absolutely, let our citizens, let our residents weigh in on the choices that affect their daily life, the monetary decisions that are made by the state. So, um, I definitely agree with participatory budgeting. Um, me being a neighborhood leader, I could not agree more with that. In addition to that, though, we also have to educate people. I agree with Mr. Gutchell. Um, the budget is extremely large. One of the things that I would like to do in the South of Omaha Neighborhood Alliance is provide space and opportunity to where we can really learn and understand the budget. One of the things that my pastor does, which um, I always appreciate, is every three months he sits there and he goes over every bit of finances with the entire church, which creates transparency, which creates that um, inclusiveness that you get people involved in that process. Thank you. The, I was on the planning board at City Hall for 10 years, and one of the things that my board, when I was chairman, did was we, we never would pass something, a development, if the developer hadn't met with the neighbors prior. And the problem we had with the developments at planning board is the notices would go out on Thursday, Friday for a Wednesday meeting. And the neighbors didn't have time to even sit down with the developers. So we laid a lot of things over to make sure that the developers, and it got to be just part of the culture where developers wouldn't come to us with a project until the, they had met with the neighbors. And that's the kind of collaboration and input when I'm mayor that we'll have. Um, in addition, with my equity officer in my cabinet, that we will be making sure we're going to look at that budget, make sure it's equitable to all people in all parts of town. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving now to our final round tonight. Uh, this will be a yes or no answer to each question. Each candidate has a green or red paper. Uh, each question I ask them will raise either the green paper or the red paper, green meaning yes to the question I will, I will ask for red, uh, meaning no to the question. We're, we're all answering at once. Is, yes. Okay, thank you. I wrote it while I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> green meaning yes, red meaning no. So, our first question Would you champion legislation allowing accessory dwelling units, for example, backyard cottages or carriage houses? As a permitted use in residential zones in city hall. Yes. 
Our second question. When you fund expansion of the city's recent and past transit-oriented development policy to corridors beyond Dodge Street, as called for in the master plan. Next question. The current city master plan was originally adopted in 1993, nearly 30 years ago. If elected, would you direct the Omaha Planning Department to start work on a new master plan? Yeses and one no. Next question. Uh, city, city family zoning has been shown to promote economically unsustainable development and has historically been used to exclude renters and lower income individuals from communities. Additionally, this type of zoning minimizes the rights of existing property owners to redevelop their properties in order to accommodate more housing options. Do you support repealing or modifying Omaha's single family zoning? Yes. Do you support reallocating funding from the police department to other city departments? Yes. Should all new developments along the orbit route include a certain percentage of affordable units? Or yes. And our final question. This is not a yes or no question. You'll get 10 seconds to respond to this. <laughs> if you win the election on May 11th, where will you have your victory party and why? We will start with this. Oh, so. wow. Um, it will probably be somewhere with my son because he turns 21 two days before Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. yeah. The capital district because it's safe. The outdoor um, and they have the big TV and a uh, summer summer with the big music venue. Um, we have to go out and kind of you know I think we're going to have to hold it at uh, in the old market passageway at Beavers because that's where my wife and I had our first date. All right, so thank all of you all for attending and we appreciate you sharing each of your visions for all along with us. And thank you our viewers for tuning in tonight. Now that you've heard from the candidates and what they have to say, it's now your time to vote. Early in-person voting started at the Douglas County Election Commission on May, on March 22nd and runs through April 5th. You can still register to vote in, per, in, in the primary in person at the Douglas County Election Commission until March 26th. Vote by mail ballots are being sent out right now. So if you requested one of those, start checking your mailboxes. April 6th is the primary election day when you can vote at your polling place. And uh, we did just drop a link in the chat to a blog post that has all of these dates on there. So if you forget or didn't hear me, you got those. Uh, so if you have any questions about registering to vote, how to check your polling place and or how to early vote, check out that link right there in the uh, chat there. And again, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you all for doing this as well, candidates, and have a great time. Make sure you vote. Thank you. Thank you.